Okay, well, welcome everybody. And thank you so much for coming to today's event on climate policy and politics, which is sponsored by the Policy Lab and the Institution for Social and Policy Studies. I'm John Dearborn and I'm a postdoc in the Policy Lab and the Center for the Study of Representative Institutions. And I'm going to help moderate today's event. Before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to begin by thanking Lamour Peer and Pam Green for all of their hard work in helping to coordinate and set up this virtual event, as well as all of our events this semester in the ISPS Policy Related Skills Training Series. I'd also like to thank ISPS Director Alan Gerber for his support of our virtual programming. And I'd like to encourage all of our students in the audience to check out our schedule of ISPS policy related skills training events over the next couple of weeks. It's a pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Leah Stokes, a political scientist who is leading the field in studying energy, climate, and environmental politics. Leah is Assistant Professor of Political Science and an affiliate with the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management and the Environmental Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Within American politics, her work focuses on representation and public opinion, voting behavior and public policy, particularly at the state level. And within environmental politics, her research examines climate change, renewable energy, water and chemicals policy. Leah's book, Short Circuiting Policy, seen here, published in 2020 by Oxford University Press, examines the role that utilities have played in promoting climate denial and rolling back clean energy laws. It received the 2020 Best Energy Book Award from the American Energy Society and was listed in the New York Times Five Climate Books from 2020. I also have to point out as a scholar of American political development myself, that this phenomenal book is part of Oxford's Studies in Post-War American Political Development series, and what an amazing work of APD scholarship this is. Leah has also contributed to the anthology, All We Can Save, which is a collection of essays written by influential women in the climate space. Her academic research has been published in some of the top journals in our field, such as the American Political Science Review and the American Journal of Political Science. And she has also published articles in such outlets as the New York Times and the Washington Post. To our audience, um, as I said, I will be moderating the Q&A portion of today's talk. I would invite you to submit questions if they occur to you during the talk itself via the chat function. And once we go to the formal Q&A, I will call on folks using the raise hand function. I would also note that this event is being recorded. During the talk itself, I ask that you please mute yourselves and turn off your videos. And Leah, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks so much for having me. I've spent a little bit of time at Yale. It's a great community and I know a little bit about ISPS and uh, it's really a wonderful place to be studying policy. So I'm thrilled to have the chance to um, share with you today. So I'm just gonna share my slides. <clears throat> full screen. Okay, great. So today I'm going to talk about my book, which John did a very generous job introducing. It's called Short, Circuit, Short Circuiting Policy. And I'm also going to talk about some of the policy work that I have been doing with some of the recent reports I have released on clean energy, which um, inform a lot uh, some of the conversations that we're having right now about how to decarbonize our electricity system. So the challenge uh, that we face is very large. We have to clean up our electricity system quickly in order to decarbonize our economy. I often say that cleaning up the electricity system is the first linchpin in economy-wide decarbonization. Why is that? Well, if we do clean up our electricity system, it allows us to electrify large parts of transportation through things like electric vehicles, buildings, through things like heat pumps and induction stoves, and also parts of heavy industry. And when we add up all these sectors, we could get to emissions reductions of between 70 to 80% through clean electricity and electrification. 
So before the last couple of years, we were talking about 2050 as the timeline for clean electricity. And that was because we were talking about economy-wide decarbonization on those timelines. And you can see here that if we set a benchmark from the year 2000 and we draw a straight line out to 2050, then essentially each year clean power has to grow by two percentage points annually. And although this ends in 2018, the data from 2020 is actually 40%, so we're directly on track. Now, but what you should notice is that we've been really living on borrowed time with our nuclear and hydropower fleet, which have been largely flat, and in the case of the nuclear fleet, have a large potential to be declining. And so we actually need renewables to be growing much faster in order to keep pace with this timeline. Now, this isn't the timeline we're talking about anymore. We're talking about decarbonizing the grid by 2035. This is what President Biden campaigned and won on, and it's very active area of discussion in policy right now. So under that scenario, we actually need to be growing clean electricity by about four percentage points every year. And that doesn't even take into account uh, the growing load um, that will be necessary to deal with electrification. So that four percentage points could be masking, you know, massive growth in the overall electricity system, meaning that it, we don't just need really 100% clean power, we need like 200% clean power. And so that could be rather than four percentage points on a 100% basis, it could be like eight percentage points on a 200% basis. So it's a lot to be doing very quickly. If you're interested in these arguments and trying to kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about here, I actually made a video which summarizes this argument from my book. It's called The Narwhal Curve, and we released it with Grist, and it's quite a nice little three-minute video which kind of gives you the basics of these ideas and can be used in classes or shared with other people who uh, maybe don't know a lot about the electricity system. Now, my book looks at the state level, and that is because the federal government has really failed in terms of uh, amplifying clean electricity. Throughout the 1990s, advocates tried to pass and failed to pass renewable portfolio standards, which are the main policy uh, I'll be talking about today, sometimes called clean electricity standards. They're very similar. Uh, what it is, is a policy that says by a certain year, like 2035, we have to have a certain percentage of our electricity system from either clean or renewable sources, like 100% clean electricity by 2035. So these renewable portfolio standards were developed in the 1990s, and advocates were trying to get one passed through Congress, but they failed. And I tell the history of those efforts in the book. Now, the closest we have come was just over a decade ago in the Waxman-Markey bill, which you may know is the very large um, climate bill that passed the House but did not pass the Senate. And that policy included a federal renewable portfolio standard for 20% renewable power by 2020. And it actually had a provision that allowed 8% of that to be met with energy efficiency. So that um, policy, when I looked back on it for my book, it wasn't considered ambitious at the time. But what's so interesting is that when we look back on it, had we passed that policy, we actually would have been further along than we are today. Now, of course, the Biden-Harris campaign uh, was really focused on 100% clean electricity by 2035. And this is something that the administration uh, has also signaled it is planning on working towards this year. So in the absence of federal action on clean power, states have really been leading the way. And throughout the 90s and early 2000s, a majority of states passed renewable portfolio standards and then later on expanded them to higher percentages and expanded them to include clean power, which usually includes nuclear as a carbon-free resource, potentially carbon capture and sequestration, although that largely does not exist, and sort of other eligible resources outside of just renewables. In addition, states passed a policy called net metering, sometimes called net energy metering. This is a policy that allows you to put solar on your roof and feed the extra um, kilowatt hours you make from that resource onto the grid and to be paid for that supply. And what rate do you get paid at? Well, you get paid the same uh, amount that you would be buying electricity. So if you buy electricity for, let's say, 15 cents a kilowatt hour, you would also be paid 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's why it's net, right? It's the difference between the amount of kilowatt hours you bought in a month versus the amount you put onto the grid. And that would be your bill. And as you can see here, again, the vast majority of states, I believe the number is 42, passed these policies throughout the 90s and early 2000s.
Now, this effort has only amplified in the last few years, and we are now in a situation where more than one in three Americans live in a place today targeting 100% clean power, whether that's the states that I'm showing here or all many cities across the country as well. So you can see here that many states have passed uh, policies targeting 100% clean power, uh, with the exception of Washington and Colorado. None of them are really as ambitious as the federal policy. Colorado has a plan for 80% clean power by 2030, which is directly on the pathway to 100% clean by 2035. And Washington state with its large hydropower resources is, is quite ahead of the curve here. But the federal policy that we're talking about would really ramp up this ambition and notably apply it to the whole country rather than having this sort of piecemeal uh, approach that we've had to date. Now, what my book looks at is the backlash that has come from interest groups and even some members of the public, although largely interest groups, against the clean energy transition. And what I show is that fossil fuel companies and electric utilities are resisting the clean energy transition in a wide variety of ways. Then, And the book is meant to kind of describe and categorize and show the tactics that these industries are using to try to undermine what we would call policy feedback. So it's possible that many in this group are familiar with the term of policy feedback, but just as a refresher, typically in political science and public policy work, we think about how politics as the independent variable, such as the election of President Biden this fall, reshapes the political landscape and makes policy, such as this clean electricity standard, um, possible. So we're thinking about politics as the independent variable and policy as the dependent variable. Now, we don't have to think in that way. We can think about how policy itself, such as the passage of a clean electricity standard or a renewable portfolio standard in a given state, can reshape the political environment by, for example, creating new advocates like clean energy companies or bolstering environmental groups, and that they can come back in later rounds and further expand the policy. So we're thinking about how policy is reshaping politics and then how politics can then shift to expand policy. And under that scenario, we get a positive policy feedback cycle, right? An amplifying cycle where a small policy at time one grows over time to be a bigger policy at time two. And that was the theory behind a lot of these policies, that we would get a first renewable portfolio standard in a given state, we would be able to um, increase that target, bring forward that timeline, and then maybe even pass one federally. But that isn't exactly how things have played out. And that's because um, what I argue is that the interest groups opposed to your policy can actually learn through that implementation of laws, and they don't just kind of go away, that incumbents remain in the political environment, and that they can try to undermine policy feedback. How do they do that? Well, I'm going to talk about that in detail, but some of the ways that I describe in the book are things like lobbying, what I call implementation resistance, which is resisting policies at implementation bodies, in my case, public utility commissions, primaries and elections, particularly how um, the Republican Party has been pulled away from climate and clean energy through uh, primary challenges, astroturfing and outside lobbying, as well as court cases. And if you don't know the terms astroturfing and outside lobbying, again, these are policy and political science terms. Astroturfing is fake grassroots campaigns where you pretend you're a grassroots organization when you're not. And outside lobbying is a concept from Ken Coleman, which is about how interest groups can organize the public to amplify their own interests, right? So one maybe positive example of that would be if you're a solar company that builds rooftop solar, maybe you're going to organize your customers to lobby on behalf of you in a, um, a policy fight. Okay, so you probably know that bills become laws, right? But policy feedback studies ask, what happens next? What happens after a bill becomes a law? And we, we are interested in looking at how policies can reshape the political environment. And what I argue is that during implementation, that's when policy feedback really takes hold because that's when resources are redistributed between advocates and opponents. And so uh, the opponent interest groups theoretically lose some of their power and resources and the supportive interest groups theoretically grow over time. Right now, what do these interest groups do? Well, they don't just lay down and die in the case of opponents and the advocates might try to expand the policy. So they either go directly to the uh, legislators to try to shift policy. And that would be a very clear policy feedback cycle. But as we know from the work of, for example, Schatz Schneider, a really important figure in um, policy work in political science, they can also, quote, expand the scope of conflict by bringing in, for example, the public as part of the fight 
And that is something that electric utilities and fossil fuel companies have been doing in the case of clean energy. So I'm going to give you two examples of that. In Kansas, which is the headquarters of Coke Industries, a major fossil fuel and petrochemical company run by uh, the Koch brothers, one of whom is now deceased, um, you know, they, they had a renewable portfolio standard and um, it was doing quite well. As you can imagine, Kansas is a very windy state. But Coke Industries wanted to roll back this policy. And so all of a sudden, this group popped up called the Kansas Seniors Alliance. And these flyers started going around saying that, call your representative, tell them to repeal this mandate. It's so terrible. It's going to jack up electricity bills for all these Kansas seniors who are struggling. So a um, lawyer <clears throat> was the person who actually registered this 501c3 organization. And they wanted to know, you know, who's behind this organization. And so what they did was they went to uh, that lawyer and they said, hey, uh, this was a journalist. They said, hey, uh, who are you working for? Like, who's the Kansas Seniors Alliance? There's no website. You know, I'm just curious who's involved here. And the lawyer said, oh, I don't work for the Kansas Seniors Alliance. I work for Americans for Prosperity, which you may know is a kind of public facing uh, front group for Coke Industries, the corporation. And it turns out that basically they had uh, formed this group on behalf of Americans for Prosperity. It wasn't just like a, a spontaneous upwelling of Kansas seniors. Now, here's an even more nefarious example of astroturfing that comes from New Orleans. In New Orleans, the utility energy wanted to build a new gas plant. And in order to do that, they had to get a permit in this case from the city council in New Orleans. And you can see there was a city council meeting and a lot of people showed up. A lot of people were wearing the same shirt. They had these signs. Typically when you have a grassroots uh, movement and organization, the signs are sort of handmade, they're colorful, et cetera. But these ones were all printed out in a mass way. And these people got up to the podium and they spoke and they said, we wanna build this gas plant. That's what we think should happen. So some journalists went up to these people afterwards and they said, you know, hey, why do you support the gas plant? And they said, oh, I don't support the gas plant. I'm an out of work actor. And I was actually paid to come to this meeting and to speak um, up in this way. And I was actually paid an extra money if I was given a speaking role. And it turns out that the utility had spent $27,000 on a PR firm who had gone and hired all these actors to show up to this meeting and pretend to be the public. And of course, this raises serious concerns about sort of democratic uh, representation and participation when a meeting, which has only a certain amount of time and a certain amount of space for voices, is being taken over by front groups. And I'll say this is actually happening right now in my um, community of Santa Barbara, where a front group for a gas company has been going to city council meetings to try to block um, the electrification of new buildings in the city and has really been taking up time from the public from participating. And they've also been texting people throughout the community to spread misinformation about what this policy is about. Now, it's not just the public that gets brought into these fights over clean energy and climate action. It's also the political parties. And one of the key arguments that I make in, the, in my book is that one of the reasons why we've seen polarization, specifically asymmetric polarization on renewables, is because the Republican Party has been pulled away from renewable energy by utilities and fossil fuel interest groups. And the way that I see that playing out in practice is through primaries. So I'm going to tell you the story of Russ Jennings, a representative in Kansas. Russ Jennings was a Republican from the western part of the state who was elected to the state house, and his part of the state actually benefited a lot from the renewable portfolio standard. He saw all these new wind projects going into his community. It was bringing in new tax revenue, employing people. It was a great thing. And so when Coke Industries started to put onto the agenda the repeal of the renewable portfolio standard, he voted against it. And the interesting thing is it wasn't just Russ Jennings. Uh, the first time a vote was held to repeal the RPS in, in Kansas, uh, as many Republicans voted to keep the policy in place, supporting renewables as voted to get rid of it, 44 to 44. Of course, the Democrats voted to keep it. Now, the next time the vote happened, which was just a few weeks later, suddenly a few less Republicans voted to keep the policy. 
And then a few weeks later, the exact same vote was held again and a few less voted. So we have a nice uh, longitudinal study here, so to speak, a panel of the same people voting on the same bill over time. And for something, there must be something intervening in the time periods as like a treatment that is somehow shifting the votes of those Republicans to be anti-renewables. Well, we happen to know what that treatment was because it was leaked to the press. Another representative named Scott Schwab said that Koch Industries, through their lobbies for Americans for Prosperity, were going to Republican members and saying, if you don't vote the right way on this bill, we are going to primary challenger challenge you. You're going to lose your money and you will find yourself with a well-funded primary challenger. Now, you might say, well, it's just one organization. What does it matter if you lose your money from Koch Industries? Well, let's think about how a Republican in the state house gets funded. Their number one source of campaign financing is the Kansas uh, Republican Party. And what is one of the top donors to the Kansas Republican Party? Coke Industries. The second biggest uh, source of donation funds is the Kansas Chamber of Commerce. And what's a top donor to the Kansas Chamber of Commerce? Coke Industries. And the, one of the, the third top donors is Coke Industries themselves. And so if a key actor like that, that has so much political power in your state says, this is a litmus test item, and you refuse to change your vote, you will find yourself losing your funding and with a primary challenger. And guess what? That's what happened to Russ Jennings. He lost his funding and he did have a primary challenger. Now, in the case of Russ Jennings, thankfully, he won re-election in part because the wind um, industry which through policy feedback was growing, right? They actually were able to field their own political action committee and were able to support him. So he squeaked through. But even if these people win re-election, think about what kind of chilling signal that, spends, that sends to the caucus overall, right? If you've ever read Fenno, for example, he writes about you know his experience of uh, spending a lot of time with uh, politicians and seeing how paranoid they are about how they could be uh, how they could lose re-election at any given moment from an issue arising in their district. And this is the kind of thing that really freaks out politicians when they think I could be primary challenged over this. And so this is how, in my view, we've seen the Republican Party pull away. From the Democratic Party, pull away from the center on climate change and really become an anti-renewables um, group. And it's very it's been very interesting watching what's playing out in Texas in the past week. And I wrote a whole thread about this based on my research because Texas is a major um, case in my book. Texas was a place where um, Republicans were supporting renewables in the late 90s and early 2000s. In fact, this seven billion dollar spending bill to build transmission for wind energy was sponsored by a Republican, quite a conservative one from the panhandle. And uh, the wind energy expansion was also sponsored by him. And yet today we see um, people like Governor Abbott blaming the boogeyman Green New Deal and um, wind energy and things like that when it's not even true. And uh, what I argue is that's because uh, there's been a lot of lobbying from fossil fuel and utilities in that state to really polarize the Republican party away from action. And this is unfortunately a pattern that's been playing out across the country over the last uh, 15 years. So you can see that in the early 90s and, and uh, early 2000s, Republican governors were actually the ones who signed these clean energy bills overwhelmingly, such as Governor George W. Bush in Texas. Um, but then by 2005, we can't find any bills that were passed under Republican leadership. And that asymmetric polarization, which is taking place at the elite level, has implications for the public. Because we know, based on research from people like Gabe Lenz, a political scientist at UC uh, Berkeley, that the public follows elites, right? If elites like Donald Trump start to say, uh, climate change, uh, sorry, wind turbines cause cancer and they're terrible and et cetera, that's gonna trickle down into what co-partisans, everyday Republicans who are listening to him are going to think about the issue. And that's exactly what we started to see around 2008 and 2009. Now, thankfully, this actually has recovered a lot in the last few years, but with the kinds of messaging we saw last week out of te Texas, you could you could imagine some kind of mass uh, polarization amongst Republicans um, happening again. So, my book looks at a lot of cases. As I mentioned, Texas is one of the main things that I went and studied as part of the work. Also, Kansas and Arizona and Ohio. Um, and if you're interested in some of these stories and you want them in a more accessible way, I actually turned the Arizona and Ohio um, 
chapters of my book into uh, podcasts as part of uh, this podcast that I run called A Matter of Degrees, which is sort of a long form uh, documentary style podcast. And it brings to life a lot of these stories. So I'd recommend folks check that out. And I've also written up some of these things in places like Vox. Now, I'll just point out that although many people are probably familiar with climate denial and how the fossil fuel industry has spent decades harassing scientists, spreading misinformation, et cetera, to the tunes of billions and billions of dollars, they this has also been perpetuated by electric utilities. Electric utilities have made a lot of problematic decisions in terms of wasting, a pro promoting a wasteful energy system, promoting climate denial, and working to roll back clean energy laws. And if you're just interested in this part of my book, or you want to share it with a class or something like that, I publish an excerpt on Drilled News. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, go to the Oxford University Press website, which is just bit.ly slash scp book. You can use this 30% off discount code if you would like, um, and then it's like cheaper and you can share that with whoever you want to. And you, uh, it also exists as an ebook, which is cheaper. If you like ebooks, I read a lot of ebooks and you can also get an audiobook. They turned it into an audiobook if that's something you're interested in. I love audiobooks. Um, so that's how you can get a copy of the book and uh, yeah, feel free to do that. I now want to talk in sort of the remainder of my presentation about some work that I'm currently doing and some recent policy reports that I've released, uh, I guess, in the last month. The first was with Sierra Club, and it looks at what utilities are doing to decarbonize their electricity supply. And the other, the second was with Evergreen and with Data for Progress, and is really about how can Congress pass a clean electricity standard as part of budget reconciliation this year. So the Sierra Club report is called The Dirty Truth About Utility Climate Pledges. And what we did is we looked at all the utilities in the country and we gave them scores. And what we found, uh, the, what, was, what was the input for the scores? The first was, are you planning to retire coal by 2030? A lot of utilities are not planning on doing that. What are your plans to build new gas? Many utilities have a lot of plans to build gas. Remember gas, fossil gas is a fossil fuel. And what are your plans to build renewables? And very few utilities have plans on that. And without a requirement at the federal level, the reality is that most utilities will not move fast enough. So this is a snapshot of a bunch of utilities in Indiana. And you can see here that NIPSCO, great utility, actually has plans to retire all its coal by 2030, has plans to build um, no new gas, and actually has plans to, to replace four-fifths of its current electricity with renewables. So that's a very winning score there. And you can see that the, the scores get worse as we get further down. Um, and Duke, in particular, has not enough plans to retire coal, is planning to build a lot of new gas, etc. So... Although a lot of utilities have adopted voluntary clean energy pledges, the point is that they are not the same as a clean electricity standard. They're not the same as a law because there's no real way to enforce them. And indeed, many of these utilities that at the parent company level, meaning uh, a lot of utilities have complex uh, holding company structures where there's a parent company and then they own a bunch of utilities and those utilities are actually the ones that make planning decisions. So Southern Company at the parent company level has made plans to, um, you know, decarbonize by 2050. But then when their uh, subsidiaries like Georgia Power and Alabama Power are planning to do, uh, what, what are we going to build next? They are not taking into consideration that parent company's pledge. And they're literally saying in proceedings, no, we don't have to do that. That's Southern. That's not us. So when you have a corporate pledge that doesn't even apply to the planning entities within the organization, what is the point of the pledge? And we can see that very clearly here, because as you can see right now, utilities are not planning to build enough renewables. If we look at the 2019 coal and gas generation, that's up to 1300 million megawatt hours. And yet we're only seeing about 250 million uh, megawatt, uh, megawatt hours of planned to clean energy additions by 2030. So there's no plan to decarbonize the electricity system without government policy. Particularly when it comes to coal plant retirements, you can see that the utilities in our report that we gave Fs to, which by the way, we graded on a curve. So you only had to get 18 or more to be out of the F range because that was the median um, score. You can see that the utilities getting Fs in our report have basically no plan to retire their coal. They are only planning to retire 7% by 2030. 
and the utilities that are doing much better in the A and B category have a lot of plans to retire their coal. So we know it's possible to be making progress, just too few utilities are actually doing it. If you're interested in looking up utilities, we only look at um, the largest oil and gas um, holders in, uh, not oil and gas, sorry, a coal and gas holders in the country. So it's not every utility, it's um, 50 parent companies and 79 subsidiaries, but your, your utility might be listed here. And otherwise you can just look at other utilities and you can get a sense of what exactly are they planning? Because although this information exists, it has never been compiled in this way. And so you'd have to be, you know, in a specific state in a specific rate case to know what, for example, um, uh, Florida Power and Light is doing, right? But now you can actually just go to this dashboard and look it all up in one place. And I think that's really a, a very powerful thing. So I'd encourage folks to check that out as a resource. Now, the other thing that I'm working very actively on is the federal policy opportunity we have before us right now. So we have an unprecedented chance to scale up the leadership at the state and local level in 2021 with comprehensive climate legislation. And the way this is going to happen is through um, budget reconciliation. So for those of you who have been following this, the current COVID package is going to be passed through the fiscal year 20 budget reconciliation process. And then uh, after that's completed, maybe in March, uh, there's going to be another package uh, that will be the Biden Build Back Better agenda. And that will include a lot of climate and clean energy uh, investments. And we're working very hard to figure out how to do a clean electricity standard as part of that package. These are just the pledges that Biden made, key pledges on standards, key pledges on investments, and key pledges on justice, specifically ensuring that 40% of these investments are going into disadvantaged communities. So is this doable? Can we actually clean up our electricity system fast? The answer is yes. If you go to the 2035report.com, it's just 2035report.com, there's an amazing study which shows what's possible. And they show that we can actually get to 90% clean by 2035 and save customers money. And that's because the coal plants that are operating in this country are actually operating at a, at a loss. But because many utilities are monopolies, there's no market-based signal to put pressure on those coal plants to retire. And so utilities are just charging customers excess money to keep those coal plants open. Many coal plants could be replaced tomorrow with a wind energy plant and save customers money. And of course, their health and our air and our climate and everything else. And you don't have to just take that from me. The CEO of NextEra, a major uh, electric uh, power uh, uh, builder in this country, has said there is not a single economic coal plant in this country full stop, period. So this is a fact. So we released this report. It's called a Roadmap to 100% Clean Electricity by 2035. And it talks through a lot of the considerations in this approach. And what we really argue is that the next two years are critical. We, anybody who follows federal policy knows that we have, as Kingdon would have told us, the policy windows. We get these moments of opportunity and they don't come by very often. We haven't had one for a decade on climate and energy. And this really creates a big opportunity to increase the pace and scale of clean energy deployment. And the fact is, as I've mentioned, this is really uh, going to build on the leadership of states uh, it's also very popular and it's very practical approach. So this isn't something we've never done before. Already more than one in three Americans live in a place targeting 100% clean power. In the report, we get we go through a lot of details about how this can be done through budget reconciliation. The basic rules of budget reconciliation are that the policy has to be primarily budgetary. It either needs to be about expenditures, revenues, and or debt. And so the way we think about passing a policy like this is basically saying, if you're doing the right thing utility, if you're building four to five percentage points a year of clean power, you get money. We will give you financial resources from the federal government. If you're not doing the right thing, you don't get that money or you get less of it, like you're missing your target. And you have to pay an alternative compliance penalty, a payment for every unit of power that you were short. So that's basically expenditures and revenues into the federal government. And it's actually quite different from state policies that involve a lot of credits and trading and all this kind of stuff. It's very simple. So you get paid for doing the right thing and building new clean, and you get punished if you don't do the right thing. 
And the, the important thing about a standard over and above just an investment strategy, which by the way, the investments, which would be the production tax credit extended for 10 years and turned into a direct pay mechanism, that's really the foundation of all this work. That's necessary. But if you just give money and you put no standards or requirements on it, we will not move fast enough. We have to say that you have to not just take that money, but you have to build enough clean power at the pace and scale that's necessary. There are a lot of other things we have to do in this package. I won't get into them here, um, but the, the, the report does if you're interested. And I'll just say that we partnered with Data for Progress on this, and they did a lot of polling on clean electricity standards. They're very popular, particularly amongst Democrats and independents. But even if you add up the sort of don't knows for Republicans, you're getting to about 50%. So, you know, it's not a very unpopular policy when it comes to uh, Republicans either. I'll also say that we have some examples of corporate leadership like Google, which is aiming for 100% clean electricity by 2030 in real time at all facilities. You know, a lot of corporations today say they're 100% clean, but what they're doing is they're buying credits, renewable electricity certificates, RECs, and they're saying that, you know, my facility is powered by clean power, but that's not real, right? That's not really those electrons coming to that facility are coming from zero carbon resources. Um, and so what Google is trying to do is actually deliver that stuff to all its facilities real time by 2030. And that would be huge because as far as I understand, Google is the largest energy consumer in the country. We also have some nascent uh, utility leadership emerging on this. And I think we're at this inflection point where utilities will hopefully stop becoming opponents to the clean energy transition. And we'll see the massive opportunity for them, not just in cleaning up the existing supply, but in building out huge amounts of new power to power transportation, buildings, parts of heavy industry, right? The scale of the electricity system is going to grow enormously and utilities should see an opportunity there. In Colorado, essentially all the utilities are committed in law to 80% clean power by 2030. And as I've mentioned, that is directly on the path to 100% clean by 2035. And Jared Polis, the governor of Colorado, was one of the people to endorse our reports based on his own leadership. Um, I do a lot of climate advocacy, if that was not obvious. Um, I run a podcast called A Matter of Degrees. Um, it has lots of interesting episodes about utilities and other things. And I also uh, contributed to this book called All We Can Save, which is a really nice collection from women across the movement about climate action. And thanks so much. And I'll stop sharing my slides now and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, so to get started, everybody, as I said, um, I think using the raise hands function would be the most straightforward way to take questions. Um, I know that we had at least one that came in the chat that I think was from um, Daniel. I don't know whether uh, Daniel, you'd like to actually ask your question or I could ask it for you. I will go ahead. Um, so this question had to do, and this is probably helpful conceptually for everybody. Um, this question has to do with sort of the difference maybe between potential capacity of renewable energy sources versus the actual sort of effective capacity on a day-to-day -day basis. So his question specifically had to do with um, whether sources like solar or wind um, always have sort of the maximum capacity possible or whether in a place like Connecticut, maybe where it's not as sunny, does that potentially um, reduce the overall contribution to the energy grid that some sources could give? So I imagine that this is sort of a common thing that um, any discussion of renewable energy is about sort of how much has to be built to meet system capacity. So if you could talk maybe a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So when we talk about any energy source, we can talk about capacity, meaning the size of the projects that, that is built. So we would talk about like a two megawatt wind turbine or like a 500 megawatt coal plant or like a one gigawatt, which is a thousand megawatts nuclear plant, something like that, right? Now, each of those sources has a capacity factor, which is how many hours of the year is this plant actually delivering power. And that's how we get from megawatts in capacity to megawatt hours in generation. And so the renewable portfolio standard or clean energy standard is on generation. It's not on capacity, right? And the reality is we have to build a lot more capacity for wind and solar because they have a lower 
uh, capacity factor. So typically, uh, wind might have a capacity factor depending on the wind resource, aka how windy it is, of like 30% or 40% or 50%. Typically, a nuclear plant, which is usually running all the time, does not shut down, has a capacity factor of like 98% or something like that. And often a gas plant maybe has one of like 80% or 90%. Um, so that's what we mean by sort of capacity factors. And so we'll have to build a lot of wind and solar, and depending on its location, it will have higher capacity factors. So if you're in a more northern latitude, you know, you put a given size, like a 10 kilowatt array of solar on your roof, the amount of kilowatt hours or megawatt hours it will produce will be lower because it's not as sunny there. And so the bigger issue is not so much the capacity factor of a given resource, it's what we would call intermittency and integration. So how do we make sure that we have enough supply at every given second everywhere as demand? Because that's how the electricity system works. What was happening in Texas, last week is that there was too much demand in part because when it got cold and nobody has insulated houses in Texas, Texas actually is like bottom of the nation in energy efficiency. People were using a lot more power. And then all these plants were tripping offline, right? And so what happens is when supply and demand get out of whack, that's very problematic. You either have to shed load, meaning reduce demand, or you have to increase supply. And in Texas, they couldn't increase supply. There was nothing else to bring online. All these plants were offline. They were frozen. They didn't have all these gas plants. They didn't have gas on site. They didn't, they didn't um, weatherize them. They didn't have any kind of alternative uh, fuel on site. And notably, El Paso Electric, which is another utility not operating in the restructured market of ERCOT, they had weatherized their plants because of a, an event, I think, in 2011. They had stored other gas, uh, another um, resource on site. I think it was like diesel or, or oil so that they had another uh, fuel and they didn't go offline. So, you know, that is really about how does the grid maintain reliability? How do we integrate all these resources? And as we get higher and higher levels of what we would call intermittent resources, which is wind and solar that are not around all the time, we need to have more transmission to connect parts of the country for where, you know, if the Midwest has a bunch of windiness, but the coasts don't, we can connect those two and we'll have extra supply over here and, and less supply over there. And then we can spread that out. So that's why transmission is so important because it allows for this geographic sharing of resources. And it's also why things like offshore wind are so important because offshore wind has a higher capacity factor because the wind is blowing more consistently in the offshore area than it is on land. So, and of course, this is why batteries are really important so that we can store power so that in any given moment, when the, let's say, uh, sun goes behind a cloud and the wind files down, we can still be drawing on power. So all of our grid is going to have to become more flexible and more resilient, but that's what we have to do no matter what. I mean, fossil fuels themselves are making our grid less resilient because they're leading to climate change, which is leading to extreme weather events like heat waves and wildfires that are destabilizing our grid. So we can't continue in the system that we've been in. Fundamentally, that's creating an enormous amount of instability in our electricity system through the impacts of climate change itself. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful and if folks are interested in sort of getting a 101 on energy, there's a book that's quite old, but I think is still quite good and it's free on the internet. It's called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air and it's by David Mackay. You can download that and you can uh, learn some basic facts about some of these things that I'm talking about and kind of get the 101 of uh, different energy sources. That sounds great, thanks so much. Um, so another question that has been put in our chat that I'll read, and maybe if Sebastian, um, who's asking it, would like to follow up. Um, so he asks, um, your analysis um, today seems to focus a lot on investor-owned utilities, and he's wondering whether your work um, looks at public-owned utilities as well, and or energy production and their progress on renewable goals, and maybe whether there's a distinction. Yeah, so um, the reality is that there's a view amongst some in the left that public power will be better than if we, so we already have in this country about four different types of utilities. One is the investor owned 
well, I think I have to do more actually than just four, but there are private corporations. Sometimes they're vertically integrated, in which case we call them investor owned utilities. Sometimes they're operating in restructured markets like in ERCOT, but they're companies making profits. Okay, that's the first type. Then we have a type called public power um, municipal utilities. These operate typically in cities and they sort of predate a lot of the larger utilities that um, expanded to become private companies. And uh, they operate outside of public utility commissions and they're often overseen by city councils. Um, so in, in California, we have Sacramento uh, SMUD, uh, Sacramento Municipal Utility District. In, in Texas, there's Austin Energy. So there are different places that have kind of city municipal utilities. Now, nobody has ever studied the electricity mix of these different uh, utilities. I have started that project, it's very hard to do. And overall, I think municipal utilities have slightly cleaner power, but I think it's partially because of where they operate and the fact that they're kind of smaller and city-based. We have a third type, which is called rural electric co-ops. These are utilities that came out of the New Deal. And I write a little bit about that in my book. And there's a, a book that will come out maybe in a year or two by Abby Spinak, who's a lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, which talks about the whole history of the New Deal and the rural electric co-ops. Anyway, these are co-ops that were put in places where um, private companies were not expanding the grid and they still exist today. Co-ops are some of the dirtiest energy suppliers in the country. Um, they have very dirty energy mixes, a lot of coal, and there are big challenges right now uh, for a lot of co-ops in terms of how do we clean up their electricity mix. And you can see that playing out in states like Colorado. And then we have also federal power authorities like the Tennessee Valley Authority. The TVA is a terrible utility. It's extremely dirty. The TVA is actually one of them that we study in our uh, Sierra Club report, if you're interested in looking at it. They have enormous amounts of coal. They are planning to build enormous amounts of gas, and they are not building renewables at a, a fast pace by any means. So uh, in, the, in the conclusion of my book, in the conclusion chapter, I, I get into this discussion of sort of public power and sort of changing who owns these things and changing their governance structure, and will that solve a problem? And my general view is no, it will not. Um, there have been attempts in Boulder, Colorado to break off from Excel for like a decade. It hasn't even happened. Um, and Excel meanwhile has pulled ahead and is one of the you know fastest renewable energy utilities in the com country. Now, maybe that's in part because of the activism of those groups putting pressure on that utility. So even if campaigns lose, to create public power. There can still be utility in these campaigns because they can um, put pressure on the utility system to shift. But I think that um, the view that ownership is a panacea for our problems is just not borne out empirically when we look at the massive different types of utilities that exist today. And the interesting thing about the utility sector is we have so many types of utilities so we can kind of see in practice, does is this associated with clean power or things that we want? And in general, it's not. And it's been interesting too, you know, watching the criticism of ERCOT, a restructured electricity system, in the wake of the crisis. There's obviously some downsides to restructured electricity systems and the, the Texas restructured system is actually quite restructured. There's also retail choice and that's in part why people are getting such insane bills and anyway. But there's also benefits to restructured system. Namely, remember how I told you about those uneconomic coal plants? In vertically integrated monopoly areas that have not been restructured, these utilities maintain these coal plants because there's no pressure on them from market signals to shut down. So some advocates for clean energy actually want more markets because then we can get signals into the system to shut down coal plants. So it's just way more complicated than you think is what I'm trying to say about the utility industry. And, and there aren't really simple answers. And I'm very open to you know public power. I know advocates uh, who are really into it, who have been disappointed that I'm not more for their campaigns. And I really like those people and I, and I understand what they're doing, but I just don't think empirically that this is uh, the path forward. And let's also keep in mind that we have like a decade to clean up the electricity system for 15 years. And, changing the structure of these utilities will take a long time and it's probably just not um, on the timeline that's that's uh, possible when it comes to cleaning up the system so that is my view others may have different views um, but yeah I also write about that in the conclusion of my book
Great. So we have one um, question, hand, excuse me, that's raised right now. A bold, a bold questioner, yes, yeah, from the I've audience. Several, several more in the chat, but I'm going to go to the raised hand um, first, if that Raise will. your hands, people, you'll get to go faster. <laughs> Right. Um, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful like um, information that you've provided. I just have a quick question about um, what kind of strategy, like um, just to help, I guess, me understand what are the strategies that um, these, I guess, uh, you like these like companies have in mind when they like misinform the public, they, they like publicly pressure, um, well, at least the, um, right now in the age of like technology, it's very easy to publicly expose their like acts to pressure like politicians. So they're taking like risky moves, which like come with expenses of their own and also hurt their like reputation politically and with the consumers. So what's like their long-term like strategy or like, do they plan on like sustaining something like this indefinitely and just keep burning money to like lobby and uh, push for false, I guess, like misinformation campaigns or what, what exactly do they have in their minds when they come up with a strategy of like adopting change or just continuing and pushing back change like can you try and help me better understand like what's like yeah. there those yeah, are thank great, you. that's a great question yeah well the thing is that these companies that i'm talking about uh apart from the utilities if it's oil and gas or gas utilities i mean apart from the electric utilities they're really in death they're in a death uh life or death situation it's an existential fight that they're having over this policy. And so you're right, there are costs to doing these things. The reputation will be tarnished. So the, the thing I talked about in California with SoCal Gas, my, my gas utility, they created a front group called Californians for Balanced Energy Solutions. They texted maybe 20% of the people in Santa Barbara. We don't know. That's just an estimate from one environmental group. Um, they spread misinformation and they got like hundreds of letters written to the city council, completely uninformed about this ban on gas in new buildings. And now why did they do that? That got them a lot of bad press. I wrote about it. Others have written about it. Well, they did it because if they lose gas hookups in new buildings, they lose their growth. They're a private corporation, right? They have to, well, they're not private, they're shareholder owned, right? They have to make growth. They have to show uh, profits. They have to show some kind of future trajectory. And so they, uh, they're fighting to the death. They're kind of like a wounded animal is what I'm trying to say. And so they, um, are willing to tarnish their reputation and engage in all kinds of dirty tactics because they they otherwise think that they're going to die and they're trying to forestall that timeline. Um, so for and it's quite bad in California right now. The California Public uh, Utility Commission Public Advocates Office is like has fines out to them for this. They have I think subpoenas trying to get more information from what they're up to. It's quite a bad public thing. There was a recent report about it in NPR and there's been reporting in the LA Times and Mother Jones and other places. Um, but it's worth it for these gas companies because we are trying to put them out of business fundamentally. And so they are um, willing to tarnish their reputation and to engage in these sort of dark campaigns to try to stay alive. And I will say it does work to some extent. I went to the city council meeting for the Santa Barbara city council after this misinformation campaign. And one of the city councilors was, even though he knew based on the, the reporting I had done, the staff at the city council talked about it. Um, other city councilors talked about it. And the people who showed up for the meeting, the front group came as did SoCal gas, but then a lot of advocates came and talked about how this was misinformation. And it was, uh, they texted all these people. But even still, it's like he fell for it, you know, because he got letters from people in his constituency and that freaked him out, right? So what they're trying to do is mobilize the public, use this astroturfing campaign, because that is something that scares politicians. The same kind of thing we saw in New Orleans with Entergy, that example I gave. So you're right, it does tarnish their reputation. It's not a really great long-term sustainable strategy for their company. But fundamentally, these companies are not sustainable companies. They don't have a long-term strategy, period. So this is just more of uh, the unfortunate same when it comes to these companies. I think um, there's a follow-up question actually on that. So go ahead. Right, sorry. Um, I, I meant to ask it as like a two-part question, right? Um, and so the, the second part is like, what's like preventing them from just you know changing their strategy and um figuring out maybe a way for them to exit the like 
gas industry and move towards renewables. I mean, they're already spending money, right? So it's like some cost for them. Why not rebrand, right? So yeah, that, so that- that's the kind of thing that everybody's been saying forever. A lot of these companies have uh, sort of asset specificity and uh, human capital specificity that's pretty difficult to just pivot into doing something else. One of the things they did in, um, in San Francisco over these gas fights is that they gave a contract to the gas company, which includes a lot of pipe fitters, right? Because you're laying down pipe for gas to build water infrastructure and upgrade water infrastructure because that's the same kind of thing, right? You're building pipes for gas, you're building pipes for water. So there is some ability potentially to retrain people or to have the industry pivot, but some industries are not very pivotable. If all you've been doing is selling a fossil fuel, in the case of fossil gas, Well, what else are you supposed to do? Some utilities have a utility side and a gas side, and those ones can see a route out because they can ramp down their gas side while ramping up their um, electric uh, utility side, right? But a lot of them just don't see an exit plan. And uh, this is also why we need transition funds to help workers out, to help transition these industries because they're not going to be around in the long term. And, uh, you know, one of the things they do is they lie. They say, we're going to have renewable natural gas or they don't, you know, this is not true. I think the estimate, I always forget it, but it's like 6% of the current gas supply uh, can be done with renewable natural gas. Let me fact check myself while I talk. And, um, you know, if, if we only have a very limited amount of renewable natural gas, uh, 13%, sorry, 13% of the existing demand can be done by renewable natural gas. We only have a certain amount that we can produce. This is by the way, from like landfills, um, CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, you know, factory farms, meat, basically. If we only have a certain amount of that kind of gas. We should probably use it for the sectors that are hard to decarbonize and where we're still going to need gas, like industry, not in our homes, where, by the way, using gas for cooking and heating is literally poisoning us, even though we don't recognize that. And there's more and more research coming out showing that the air quality impacts of gas stoves are terrible. They increase the risk of childhood asthma 42 percent. I mean, it's really quite bad, the air pollution impacts of gas in our homes. So we probably shouldn't be using gas in our homes anyway. And if we have some renewable gas, that's going to need to be used in sectors where we really can't decarbonize other ways. So anyway, yeah, it's not a happy story. This is why we need transition funding. One of the things that the Biden administration did in their executive orders on climate was that they set up a um, uh a committee or a dialogue on transition funding to try to think about some of these sectors in our economy that are going away and try to do a kind of planned uh, transition for those communities and for those workers. Thanks so much. Um, I'm, I have some questions in the chat that I um, definitely will get to, but I'm gonna go next to Sam. Hello, uh, hey Leah, thanks for your talk and discussion. Um, I'm curious to ask a question that's a little bit outside the scope of the book, but extending a little more to contemporary climate politics about um, basically politics around a a Green New Deal, as opposed to uh, policies about, you know, like rules and caps and standards. Um, I guess a Green New Deal could mean different things, but uh, a policy that is about investment in things, energy, jobs, transit, et cetera. And I'm curious from the state level, particularly, um, if you think all climate advocates in all states decided to pursue state Green New Deals instead of standards if you think um, like similar opposition would be met, but different active supporting organized or unorganized constituencies. Um, Yeah, Yeah. well, the first thing I'll say is that another way of thinking about the Green New Deal framework is standards investment justice. And so standards are not outside of the purview of a Green New Deal framework. And a lot of the ways that people tend to think about what's outside are more like cap and trade, carbon pricing, sort of market-based mechanisms to environmental policy. The reason why we can't just do an investment only approach is because we will not get where we need to go at the pace and scale that's necessary. What all the modeling shows is that you give money, but it doesn't get you to the deployment that you need. And so we have to have some kind of requirement to mop up at the end of the day and say, it's great that you're building stuff, but you actually need to build enough stuff. And there, with climate change, 
there is a huge difference. And I think this is one of the fundamental contributions of the Green New Deal. Thinking about the scale and the scope of the problem, the pace that's necessary, um, not just sort of saying, oh, we'll do a little climate policy, we'll, we'll put a price on carbon, we'll hope that it reduces some emissions. We actually say, here's how much emissions we have to reduce, here's how much clean power we need, here's when we need it by. That was one of the key things in terms of reframing it around 2030 in particular. And I will say too that the Green New Deal um, framework resolution included clean power as a really key um, part of the approach. So I think that the approach with standards, investment, and justice is really the way forward and that, that builds on the Green New Deal framework. And you know, states can't really do that because they don't have the power of the purse like the federal government does. And of course, in this exact moment that we find ourselves in right now, they're in terrible financial shape, a lot of states and cities. And so this piecemeal approach that we've had which is not getting us where we need to go, um, is not going to be able to leverage that investment. So as much as I think a lot of groups can get around investments and be like, yeah, that's all, it's all, it's all carrots. But at the end of the day, there has to be a stick. There has to be something to say, and if you move too slowly, you're in trouble. A carrots only approach will not move us at the pace as necessary. And we can design some of those sticks to make sure that they're not, um, imposing costs on consumers or, um, you know, creating more inequality, right? Like we don't have to have sticks be like a carbon price that is very consumer facing costs. We can have them be designed in other ways where we're not pushing the costs of the transition on to everyday people. So that that really is the way that a bunch of us have been thinking and writing and working on the, the standards approach is really in line with um, sort of the Green New Deal standards investment justice uh, framework. Um, another question that we have in our chat um, is about sort of the different types of renewable energy um, that we might need. And so this question basically is talking about how maybe solar and wind especially need obviously a lot of land mass or water mass for offshore um, wind areas. Um, and so what would the role potentially be for nuclear power um, in any um, large renewable energy re revolution? Yeah, nuclear, the thing I spend so much of my time, either people loving it or hating it, and that's my time a lot of the time. You know, the reality is that within clean, nuclear counts. It's not a carbon emitting resource, but the reality too is that um, we're not building new nuclear really, apart from like Vogel, one plant. Um, we uh, are likely to be losing some of the share Losing the share would could be very bad in terms of if it's replaced by gas, which is what often happens. Um, so it, we need to be ramping up renewables so much more. And we probably need to keep nuclear online to the extent that we can in order to um, extend the timeline to figure out how we're going to get to 80, 90, 100 percent renewables without nuclear potentially. So um, the, the hardest part of nuclear is actually its cost. It really struggles to compete on cost. And so I don't necessarily see a kind of nuclear revolution coming down the pipe, nor do I see a clean electricity standard um, you know, propping up nuclear or anything like that. What what a clean electricity standard will do is not allow retiring nuclear to be replaced by gas. It will require that if you fall behind on your target, you have to make that up with clean stuff and continue to make progress on the pace that's necessary. Because not only do we not want nuclear to be replaced with gas, we want it to be replaced with renewables. We also don't want retiring nuclear to put us farther behind the timeline that's necessary. So the standard can do all of those things by basically saying, here's the trajectory you're on. You have to stay on that trajectory. If you shut down nuclear plants, you got to make up for that and you got to keep staying on the trajectory. So that's really the approach that we have been developing. Um, and, you know, I understand that some people are very pro-nuclear and I am not anti-nuclear. Um, but I think there are real barriers to nuclear in terms of public acceptance, cost, et cetera. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily see a lot of nuclear coming down the pipe. I know others like Bill Gates disagree. Um, and who knows, maybe we will we'll need it because it is a higher energy density, meaning you don't need as much land to do it. And as we get to higher and higher levels of renewables, we could end up seeing huge fights over 
resources in terms of, well, why are you putting a transmission line in my backyard? Why are you putting a wind turbine? And, you know, there are real trade-offs, real material trade-offs in the energy transition. And so if people don't want these wind and solar projects everywhere, um, you know, then nuclear may have to be something that's considered as a society. But so far, people are pretty anti-nuclear. So I don't think that that is the trade-off that will be made. Um, so another question that I have in our queue um, that I'll read it seems there is a potential conflict between the 2035 target of a zero carbon grid and the 2050 target of a net zero economy. If states start electrifying transport and buildings now, perhaps meeting the 2035 target will be harder. If they do focus only on grid decarbonization, the 2050 target will get even more out of reach with a late start on electrification. Um, how do you think this will play out or, or maybe should play out? I mean, we don't have some insane electrification pace that's going on right now. We need to be real about where we're at. I mean, I have an electric vehicle and I am electrifying my home, but the vast majority of people are not doing that. So we can say that electrification is coming any moment and it will make it really hard in the next 10 years. And of course the package will include incentives to get that stuff going, but we are not at a point when it comes to EV adoption or, uh, building electrification where we have to stress about this at this moment. Um, I wish we were, to be honest, you know, of course it would make it harder from a grid electrification perspective, but we're not at that moment. Keep in mind too, that even if let's say we fall behind on electricity decarbonization because demand is surging because of EVs and, um, a home electrification, building electrification, that's not a bad thing because we have to think about the overall energy, uh, sorry, carbon intensity of the energy system of the economy. And what we already know based on research from RMI and lots of other academics is that pretty much everywhere in the country, electrifying buildings, electrifying cars is a win. You win in terms of producing carbon. So, um, you know, if we somehow slow down the pace of the electricity system decarbonization, but speed up the pace of transportation and buildings, it's going to be a net win. Right now, the only sector that's been decarbonizing is electricity, right? So, and the only viable pathway to decarbonizing transportation and buildings and getting rid of the oil and gas chunk is electrification. So these things are not intention. They're really in tandem. As we move faster on electrification, we got to build more stuff. Um, but it also is a way for utilities to come on board because they're going to see a massive opportunity in building all this stuff, serving more load. Um, I, I just briefed a utility group this morning and said, this is the biggest opportunity. If Samuel Insull and Thomas Edison were alive today, they'd be like, holy, shit, we could build all this new stuff. It's amazing. And so it's like a once in a century opportunity. Um, so I do think that Utilities are about to flip and become allies, which will be amazing. Um, and electrification is really the key to that uh, shift in their position. It's really interesting. Um, so I would encourage folks to keep submitting questions um, or, or even better raise your hands, um, but I'm gonna take a prerogative and ask one of my own here. So I know we have some American politics, um, graduate students in the audience in particular, and I think um, certainly one of the most intriguing things about your book um, on a theoretical to me is the move you make to sort of um, take on some of the conventional wisdom about policy feedback, path dependence, um, the idea that policy feedback could be short circuited, as you say. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of where your theoretical insight into that came from, um, how you noticed this in climate and energy policy in particular, um, and sort of what it was like to be working on this project that maybe took a very different approach to sort of, I think, one of the classic themes of political science and especially APD. Yeah, so I had two people on my committee, uh, Andrea Campbell, who's a very important scholar in the policy feedback space, and Judy Laser, who is now passed away, and who was a really important um, uh, environmental politics scholar. And uh, Judy, in particular, had gone to a lot of workshops in the late 90s at Harvard when um, KKV was being written, and she was really into uh, sort of that approach where you're sort of selecting with variation like you would a regression where you're like, here's a case where policy feedback happened, here's a case where policy feedback didn't happen, and you're trying to like tease out the differences. And so the early setup of my project was in that way because she really believed in that framework. Um, 
the nice thing about that is that it allowed me to look at kind of the more unusual cases, the cases where things don't go to plan. And in that way, kind of look at the scope conditions around policy feedback in a more critical way, right? Like under what conditions do we get this lock in? And is it is it deterministic? Is it really path dependence? Or are there forces at work trying to undermine that lock in? And so it's not as if my book is saying this is the most likely outcome for clean energy standards. I think a lot of people read it and they somehow assume that's what I'm saying. No, T carbon taxes and other policy approaches have probably way more backlash than clean energy standards do. And I look at the cases where the feedback doesn't take place. So that's not representative. There are cases like California where it's a, a, a positive cycle or even Colorado, New Mexico, New York, all those places I looked at. That's the modal or even the, the likeliest outcome. But by looking at the cases where what we don't predict will happen, you know, um, I think that it gives us a lot of insight in the forces moving against policy feedback and the forces moving against lock in and help us understand sort of organized combat, contestation in politics, interest group capture, all these things that I think play out a lot, even in the cases where things are going to play. We still have interest group capture there. It's just normatively in line with what we'd like to see in the world, right? So um, yeah, the, the project definitely evolved. And if you read my dissertation, which is available online and some people still cite, you'll see that there are different cases in it. They are more uh, set up in terms of a KKV approach. And I, I think I moved away a lot of, from that in the final um, book. And, you know, Andrea Campbell has written a lot about how, you know, the policy feedback cases tend to be, I don't know if selecting on the dependent variable is the right way of putting it, but people look at successful cases of lock-in, right? They tell the happier stories. And so one of the things I wanted to do here was look at the more depressing stories, even though they're not the modal outcome. I think it's really important that we look at the, the cases that don't conform to our theories as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if I can follow up on that with, a, with another very political science oriented question, which again, I think many in this audience will appreciate. Um, another of the concepts that you introduce in your book that I particularly find intriguing is this idea of the fog of the, a fog of enactment on a policy. Um, and I wondered if you could um, elaborate a little bit on what that is and why it matters so much, particularly that move again from the actual legislation, maybe ambiguities in it to the contestation over implementation. Yeah, so I think there's a puzzle for policy feedback theory, which is that if we have incumbent opponents and they have perfect information, they know exactly what's going on, why would they ever let a policy pass that would undermine their power, right? Why would they do that? And yet policies pass that undermine incumbents' power fairly regularly. And so what I argue in the book is that incumbents do not have perfect information that in fact, no political actors, whether it's policymakers, their staff, interest groups, the public, they don't know what legislation is going to do during the negotiation process. And I came to that based on a lot of interviews with people making laws in various places, interest groups trying to influence laws, and even looking at statements from people like Nancy Pelosi in, in sort of a congressional context. And so I have quotes from like fossil fuel lobbyists who are extremely powerful. And in the case of Texas, literally like maintain a desk in the relevant senator's office. OK, very <laughs> strong relationships. And yet they said, if we knew that the policy would have done this, we would have blocked it. Right. Because when policies are written on paper, it's. Um, it's very ambiguous what they're going to do in practice. And one of the things, if you read my book in the second chapter, I did a survey of state legislators and staffers. And I asked them like, how often did policies do what you think that you thought they were gonna do? And especially in the climate and energy space, I found that a lot of staffers and legislators said that they just didn't do what they expected a lot of the time. And so implementation is where a lot of the ambiguity in laws is ironed out. Sometimes that ambiguity is left in laws intentionally in a way that um, Douglas Arnold writes about, sort of in traceability, where you say, I don't want to be held responsible for whatever the outcome is, so let's not put it in statute and let's punt it to the implementing agency to make that decision. Um, other times, you know, you're not really sure what policy is going to do. You're, you're, you know, people are writing leg legislative text on the fly, you know, especially these days in both the state and the federal context, 
these bills stretch to the hundreds, thousands of pages. Um, people don't even know what's in them when they're voting on them. You see this more and more and more. And so that's where this ambiguity comes in. It's, it's funny. I tell the story of, um, I think I tell the story in the book of the, the Trump tax cuts. They initially passed the bill. I don't remember through which chamber. And it included something that accidentally would have actually reduced um, the corporate, um, uh, you know, the amount of taxes that corporations have to pay. It would have made their tax rate go up, essentially. And that wasn't what they wanted to happen, but they actually passed the bill before folks read the bill. And they said, oh, gosh, we got to go back and repass the bill. And so they repassed the bill to fix that problem, right? There's, there's always so much um, uh, pressure in Congress about, you know, the timeline of how we're going to get this thing passed. There's two chambers involved. It's a very complex negotiating space. And so in the book, I describe all these factors that make this ambiguity, uncertainty, and the fog of enactment stronger. Things like new policies, very complex bills, technical policy domains, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, I, I think that this really does reflect how policymaking happens. And, you know, now that I'm somewhat engaged in the policymaking process myself, it certainly feels how it is happening. Nobody really feels like they know what's going on, including interest groups and politicians and their staff. So uh, it's way more ambiguous as a space. And, and, you know, if you've ever read legislative text, it's legal. It's very complicated and hard to understand what it does. Different parts of it can interact with other parts of it. And critically, parts of federal law can interact with parts of state law. So when we have jurisdiction across federal and state areas that are shared, you do one thing at the federal level and suddenly it causes these consequences when a state policy passes that interacts with it, right? So this is why we, we are operating in a very complex environment. And um, I think that oftentimes interest groups don't know what's going to happen and they get caught off guard. And that's how we can kind of explain the beginning of a policy feedback process when incumbents exist and should be opposed to that policy ever passing in the first place. Um, so speaking of your own advocacy and public engagement in this area, um, I thought it would be good, especially to conclude, and we have both graduate and undergraduate students that I know are deeply passionate about these issues. Um, First, if maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you originally became um, interested both as a scholar and as an advocate um, in climate change and energy policy. Yeah, sure. I write about this in the book, All We Can Save, which is a nice uh, collection of essays. Um, when I was an undergrad, I got involved in an energy conservation campaign, trying to get people to save energy, like as a psychology major. Um, and I just, at the end of that, felt that it wasn't a big enough lever that if we really wanted to tackle climate change and solve our problems, we had to work on the level of policy. And so that's what I've been focusing more and more on. In, of course, I initially studied people making these big changes. And it was fascinating interviewing some of the advocates who you know, managed to get into law, these sweeping changes, like a $7 billion transmission uh, investment. And so many times uh, that quote, like never doubt that a small group of committed people can make change is the only thing that ever has. It is very true. Like you might feel like, what can I ever do? Um, and, you know, you have to build your career and develop your networks and everything else. But it is very true that dedicated people who show up and who engage in the process can really deeply shape policy. And I learned that by interviewing in my book all these people who made that happen or failed to make that happen but got close. And that, I think, has really inspired me to say, well, you know, we have an opportunity right now. I have skills and ability to support that opportunity and I'm going to do that. And one of the skills that I have is that I can communicate very well to lots of different audiences. I can make a technical area understandable to people. And so that's one of the things that I lend to this effort, whether that's, you know, speaking or doing podcasts, um, you know, writing op-eds, making things understandable to people. And the other thing that I do well is connect people together. And so uh, I often think of myself as like a yenta to the climate movement where people reach out to me all the time. And one thing we can do is organize, right? We can connect people with other people. We can make connections. We can, um, by working with others, get new things done. And, and because I've been very flexible and not seen my career as, 
I write academic papers and that's it. Um, I've been able to, for example, write that report with Sierra Club, um, which just came out of some conversations we were having about some academic work I was doing. And interestingly, I abandoned the academic paper because I felt it wasn't really relevant enough and moving fast enough. And then I wrote this policy report instead with the NGO. So, you know, we have choices that we can make about how practical and applied we want our work to be. And at least as somebody who works in climate change and energy and the urgency of now, I feel that my work should be as practical as possible. And that's really how I orient um, myself. So I think, I think your answer here has given us some insight into this, um, but I'm curious if you have any specific advice that you would give and, and maybe also whether it might be different to um, undergraduate students or graduate students um, interested in climate and energy politics and policy specifically? Well, I would say um, one thing that I did is I took a lot of interdisciplinary coursework throughout my education at the undergrad masters, another masters PhD level. I took engineering, toxicology, chemistry, um, you know, management, finance, economics, policy, politics, uh, all kinds of stuff. And hydrology, carbon capture and sequestration, of course, lots of classes on energy and electricity. And by taking such a broad, and psychology, by taking such a broad um, swath of training, that really has set me up well to understand the climate and energy problem deeply, because I understand, you know, biogeochemistry at a basic level. I was in a chemistry lab in my PhD for like five years, um, atmospheric chemistry. Obviously I don't run atmospheric chemistry models for my job, but I didn't think that was like a waste of my time or something I couldn't engage in. And I did these interdisciplinary papers with scientists who are working on models and I helped explain, you know, what are the policy or political implications of that? And so Having this knowledge in a lot of different areas is extremely powerful for the climate and energy space because it is technical, it is science based, um, there's so many disciplines that weigh in on what we do. Um, and so that's been a really critical thing in terms of my learning and I feel that it is something that sets me apart from many others and that I can uh, dialogue fairly fluently with very technical people, even though I am a political scientist, policy expert, whatever. Um, so I would really encourage people to do that, to stretch outside of their comfort zone, take different classes, learn basic um, science and engineering, because um, it really is a great foundation for the work. Um, work in interdisciplinary spaces with folks who are open to it. Um, and everybody I worked with throughout the way was very applied and normative, even if they were asking sort of very positivist questions and doing very, you know, rigorous work. Um, and that always creates a community of solidarity where all of us are mission focused, even if we come from different communities. So, so that's really what I would say um, is probably my advice. I would also encourage people to join organizations, get involved in um, climate activism, if that's something that they feel strongly about. You know, it isn't something that I did a lot because in the early years, because I, as you can probably tell, I'm a fairly nerdy person. I like studying and writing and learning. And I, I didn't feel as comfortable with protesting or things like that. Um, but other people might feel the opposite. And I think we've seen just how powerful protesting is to the movement. And this is something that I, of course, do more now. And Ayanna Johnson, who's one of the editors of this book, she always says that, you know, the climate movement needs everything. And so whatever your talents are, you should bring that to the movement. Um, you know, if you can, if you write music, some people write songs about climate change, or if you, um, you know, uh, like writing, you can write about things. If you like organizing, you know, you can lend those resources to help organize groups and get things done. And so whatever you like, whatever is your passion or skill, that is something that the climate movement can use. Um, and so I would just encourage people to uh, bring their skills to the movement. Well, thanks so much for that. And that's really good advice for everybody here, I think, to follow. I'm especially thinking about all the interdisciplinary op opportunities you have. And if you're an undergraduate at Yale and a graduate student at Yale, just the sheer amount of different classes that you can take um, so one last question from me, which I'm sure is sort of on everybody's minds. Um, obviously, you right now are deeply engaged in your reports and your work on the potential policies that the Biden administration can try to pursue um, through reconciliation. I imagine also maybe some things through unilateral action at the EPA or otherwise. So I'm curious, um, 
what do you think the most, what, what would make you optimistic of something big happening um, in the next two years? Or what do you think the most likely good thing to happen in the next two years is? Well, I'm already very optimistic. I think the Biden and Harris administration has staffed up very aggressively on climate and energy. I know many of the people who are holding key positions and they are dogged advocates for the right side of history. So I feel very, very strongly that this is um, going to be a landmark administration on climate and clean energy. And I think what I am looking forward to is the next bill, <laughs> the budget reconciliation bill that starts in, a, in a, maybe a month or two um, on, on the Build Back Better climate and clean energy agenda. Um, I think it's going to be absolutely transformative to our society, and uh, I think we're going to pass it. And that is not what I would have said years ago. You know, that's where the power of the youth climate movement, of so many people from, you know, Governor Inslee running for president, also the impacts of climate change in practice, like heat waves and, and fires and hurricanes like the IPCC 1.5 degree report. There's all these factors, Greta Thunberg, right? Like all these factors have just raised the salience for politicians so much more of our issue. And we're no longer a tier two issue. We're really a top flight issue, not just for the Biden and Mint, but for many senators and representatives. So I am extremely hopeful that the package will include a clean electricity standard, as well as other key investments um, on buildings, transportation, uh, electricity, uh, making sure we deal with EJ issues. We are investing in the transition into disadvantaged communities that are formal foss former fossil fuel communities or former sites of polluting infrastructure. Um, I just think that this is like, this is the wax from Marquee 2.0 without the cap and trade bill, without the cap and trade part of it. And um, yeah, it's like the biggest opportunity in more than a decade and it's coming. It's coming very fast. <laughs> so I spend all day every day on that pretty much. Um, and I feel really, really hopeful and excited that we have uh, a chance. Um, and the general timeline that people talk about is like maybe March or April until August or September is when this bill would be negotiated. So it's happening. I would encourage people to plug into organizations as we get closer to bills, write to your uh, senator, write to your representative, keep the pressure up because we've just seen the power of, of people pressure to get climate change at the top of the agenda. That's great to know. And that gives us all uh, something to look forward to, hopefully, and certainly to keep close tabs on um, and perhaps advocate for, because again, I know how many of you care about this that are in our audience. Um, so we're just about at time. Um, so I'd just like to say a couple of things before we conclude. Um, one is I know that many folks in the chat, a few of you have asked um, whether the video of this will, event will be available because I think you wanna go back, learn more because there's just so much knowledge and information um, packed into Leah's presentation for us all to take away. So that video um, will be made available and it will be directly um, emailed out to those who have attended today um, to go back and look at. I would also encourage you all, um, if you are users on Twitter, um, to follow Professor Stokes on Twitter. Um, I think I am probably one of many, many political scientists um, who follow you um, for many reasons, but as sort of the primary source of our information and news about climate policy and politics. So if you're looking for you know, a great source of information on all fronts on these issues, highly encourage you to do that. Um, and more generally, I would encourage everybody to go get this book. It is fantastic. Um, obviously, if you care about climate and energy policy, um, you'll learn a lot from it. Um, if you're you know, an American politics graduate student, or frankly, just anybody interested in politics and a new take on some classic questions in political science, you're also going to get that out of this book. Um, so go do that and read it. And finally, just thank you so much, Leah, um, for being with us today amid your very busy schedule um, of work towards a better outcome in these areas. We so appreciate it. Um, and I know that all our faculty, students and staff have learned a lot today. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here with all of you and hope everybody hangs in there with the pandemic.